Welcome again. Now, former Cocoa Board Chief Executive Dr. Stephen Opuni is in court against the state demanding the production of documents to be used against him in court. He wants the prosecution to be ordered by the courts to produce all documents which have come into its possession, uh, custody or knowledge in the course of the investigations. Dr. Opuni and private businessman Seidu Agungu faced 27 charges of causing financial loss to the state. In the writ, the plaintiff said the demand for the documents was in exercise of his constitutional right to all facilities necessary to adequately defend himself. Here are highlights of the reliefs he is seeking. All witness statements of Dr. Puni and Seidu Agongo, all witness statements of prosecution witnesses to be called at trial, all witness statements of persons obtained by prosecution who would not be called at the trial. All letters written by Cocoa Board through Dr. Stephen Opuni to the Public Procurement Authority for permission to sole source contracts for all fertilizers. All letters written by the PPA in connection with Little Vit Folia Fertilizers during tenure of Dr. Stephen Opuni as CEO of Cocoa Board. All certificates issued by CRIG for all fertilizers including Lithovit Folia Fertilizer before, during, and after the tenure of Dr. Opuni as Cocoa Board CEO. All certificates issued by CRIG for all fertilizers, including Lithovit Folia Fertilizer from March 2018, as well as renewals of all such certificates. All contracts for fertilizers entered into by Cocoa Board from January 20, 2008 to March 2018. The directives of Dr. Opuni issued to CRIG instructing it to reduce and or shorten the time for testing of Lithovit Folia Fertilizer. All contracts executed between Cocoa Board and Agricult Ghana Limited for Lithovit Folia Fertilizers. All reports issued by CRIG on the effect of all fertilizers including Lithovit folia fertilizer after use for 2008, 2009, 2010, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017. The two test results issued by Ghana Standard Authority for Lithovit folia fertilizers and all proceedings together with findings of the investigative body set up by Cocoa Board in connection with little bit folia fertilizer well general uh, attorney general uh, gloria ekufu has been speaking about the request she confirmed receipt of the writ to join news and says the prosecution will make available documents being requested by the accused served with an application by their lawyers in that matter it is not new um the in the supreme court a hypothetical application. It also, the similar application was made in the Republic versus Baffin and the others. That too is pending in the Supreme Court. So it does not come to me as a surprise that the same request is being made. Now, what is at stake? We have different ways of prosecuting, either summarily or by indictment. By indictment means that you, you prosecute through a jury. Summarily, you don't use a jury. Now, summarily, when you prosecute summarily, you do not, by the rules, provide the accused persons with the evidence that you intend to rely on. Now, their request allegedly is premised on the constitutional provision that says that an accused person must be given a fair opportunity and facility to enable it to defend the suit. In the Bafuboni case, we readily said that, look, we are able to give you whatever we have on hand that we intend to rely on in prosecuting our case. And any that may become available to us subsequently. We did. Strangely, he came back with a formal application asking not only what we intend to rely on, but even evidence that we do not intend to rely on. That clearly is not supported in the law. So we resisted it. 
and it occasioned a referral to the Supreme Court. It's a similar application that has been made, which is going to be heard on the 11th. So we are going to court. We are prepared to give them what we are going. We have nothing to hide. After all, we believe in the right of the individual to defend himself, particularly when it's against the people that they are presumed to be innocent. Now, the rector of the WA Polytechnic, Professor Emmanuel Owusu-Mahafo, has denied accusations by lecturers there that he breached procurement procedures to buy a Mercedes-Benz car worth half a million Ghana CDs. The lecturers claim uh, he failed to go through the appropriate procedures to acquire the vehicle. Earlier on Monday, the lecturers blocked the entrance of the school to prevent the rector from entering the premises. However, as you can see from the video we will be showing you, Professor Usumafo forced his way in. <laughs> Well, the rector who has been suspended by the governing council pending the outcome of an investigation into allegations of willful financial fraud against him has denied the accusations against him. He spoke on Newsnight. I think uh, I do not accept that it's fraudulent. I've been a professor for so many years, at least eight years. And uh, if you say that I will acquire something fraudulent, as if, excuse me to say, I do not have so much enough to be able to get myself a car. Those who know me know the kind of cars I've used. And so when you say fraudulent, it's quite interesting. So, what, so when, when they allege... I'm, I'm coming, please. Mm -hmm. I'm a person who, I mean, I've been trained well. And I've never taken anybody's money anywhere. So when you say fraudulent, it's not true. They are thinking that the car is just expensive. That's their problem. And in my conditions of service, they never stressed that the car should be 500 or 800 or 200,000 or 150,000 that you buy. They say any car of your choice. There was no threshold of how much the car should cost. And so if there's any problem in the regard to buying that car at that high price, it is the problem of the condition of service as per written. And so that is something they should look at. And two, the idea of saying that, what do you call it, um, I do not follow the government process. Look, they can bring people from the, what do you call it, from uh, public accounts committee to come and investigate uh, me for that. And then they will see every paper that we use. We follow the procurement process. When I arrived in the school last year, I mean, first February 2017, it was the finance officer, that, I mean, the acting finance officer, who brought me the paper, a document saying that that budget plan for the 2017 was what? Approved by the IMC, that's the Interim Management Committee. And that it is time for us to seek permission from the NCT and then again from the that fund to approve of it for us to begin spending. So on, on vehicles, let me tell you, I purchased, we purchased uh, three vehicles, that is three pickups from Toyota, and then also the Mercedes-Benz. The, uh, the three I mean, vehicles from Toyota, the NCT executive secretary has approved of it for it to be paid off. But the Mercedes-Benz, he has, is yet to approve of it. The question is why? Because they say, they say that that Mercedes-Benz cost just too much. Um, it's not too much, but it is not my problem. It is the problem of the conditions of service. But the, they said the conditions didn't specify which car you can buy. No, the conditions of service also did not specify how much. So, so you you chose that you wanted a Mercedes Benz. Not I chose that I wanted a Mercedes Benz. We were looking at three cars: Mercedes Benz, Nissan, and Toyota. And you and chose the specifications that had been advertised. It fitted the Mercedes Benz. There those who be there for it. It fitted the Mercedes Benz, so we chose that. We voted at the procurement uh, committee, and it was 4 3. Okay. It was not my own decision. So, 4 3 in favor of the Mercedes Benz. That is it. And you also vote, so you are part of the four? Yes. So, so your vote decided the tie? Because it would exactly. have been. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Now, but, so, how much, is, how much is the Mercedes Benz? It's 502,000. 
Well, some staff of the Wa Polytechnic have been justifying why they blocked the entrance. This is a procurement procedure. It was quite clear that the rector since taking office in February 2017, he had the intention to buy the cars. Council was not in place. The Protonic Act 7456 clearly that council is in charge of resources of the institution, whether financial or fixed access. And our council was not in place. And you advertised to procure these things. You didn't only advertise to procure cars, you also included tables and chairs. All were in the same advent. The man would have been so close out that we suggested to you the wait for council to come and give you the approval for you to go ahead and do that. The rector only provides budgetary estimates to the council. Council approves of him and then he He says the council approves subsequently. Estimate. You say that's council not true? Never asked where. where did the council approve that? Okay. So so let me ask you, just, just for the sake of time, what is it that you're going to do now? Because he has a court um, papers allowing him to come and work until this. he's given a hearing on the 16th of May. The, the, the question is that he says he has an injunction. Was there an ex party injunction that was granted to him? Wasn't that this morning they brought the court bridge? Yeah, so, so why, why did you decide to chase him rather than report him we, to the police? No, he, the way he came attacking us, he came to the, when he came to the office, you had a lot of, a lot of suspending you. If you went to court and you were given, you were you given, given an injunction, which is not so, you were, you were given, the injunction was granted, which is not so, on restraining the suspension, which isn't so, let me state it clearly. Then you could go through the same procedure through council chairman and come back. But you don't come banging the table on the security man, go kicking your office to kick open it. You don't end there by entering so, the bus that you and tell you so, that. So, 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 so fine, let, let me ask, will, will you allow him back on the campus tomorrow if he wants to come and work? My brother, if he comes attacking us, of course, we, we will have to defend ourselves. What we did this afternoon is not a story we attacking him. It's how he was driving on campus. Why you can't press and kick in the table? We went to the police station. If we're not law abiding, why didn't you attack him? So, so, so tomorrow, if he comes in peace, drives to his office where you allow him. Now, if he comes in peace, Council Chairman says he can come in peace and what time? Okay. We don't have any power to do that. But uh, if that's what the court says, it's a different thing altogether. Away from that, an Accra Circuit Court has sentenced two suspects who escaped lawful custody at the Kwabanya Police Station. Uh, in January uh, to 66 months in prison. The convicts were handed the sentence after they pleaded guilty to escaping from lawful custody and conspiracy to escape from lawful custody. Jacqueline Johnson Quay was in court and has filed this report. In the Hollywood fashion, the two convicted, including four other inmates at the Kwabenya police station, escaped custody in January. Six armed men attacked the police station, killing a senior police officer in the process. Kofi Daku, who has been in custody for the past four months since hearing began, was sentenced to 32 months in prison. Emmanuel Kote, who was rearrested by the police 21 days ago, was also handed a 34-month jail term. The two pleaded guilty to the charges of unlawful escape from police custody and conspiracy before a court presided over by Justice Abuaje Tando. Meanwhile, trial for the nine persons arrested in connection with the SAGE opened their defense at the same court on Monday. Hearing continues on Tuesday. Jacqueline Johnson Quay, Joy News. You're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a short break, but still ahead, alleged rapist of 24-year-old Italian girl at Damongo Hospital denies allegations leveled against him. We would hear the latest on that matter. And we are seeking justice for Latif after the break. You're welcome back. Now, the Multimedia Group Limited says it will push for justice for its reporter left with a fractured skull following assault by the police. Latif Idris sustained fractures to his skull when officers managing a protest by NDC supporters hit him with sticks and the butt of a gun two weeks ago. Shortly, we'll tell you what assurances the police have been giving in investigating the matter. But first, here are details of that incident leading to Latif's uh, predicament. Let's 
Latif Idris was on assignment covering the arrest of Koku Anidoho. Latif was seriously beaten by some police officers on duty. This unfortunate incident has been condemned by the Ghana Journalists Association, the Media Foundation for West Africa, and the Alliance for Women in Media Africa. Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, John Peter Mew, visited Latif Idris at the hospital. A high-powered delegation from the NDC also visited Latif. The case of the police brutality was reported at the Cantonments police station. Doctors' report indicate that Latif has a fractured skull. The Inspector General of Police sends a delegation to join you to assure the team that the police will not shield the perpetrators. Also, the police says it will ensure the matter is thoroughly investigated. Officials of the service gave the assurance when they paid a courtesy call on the multimedia group Monday. Ifwa Evans Chinnery has more. The Cantonment Police and the Intelligence and Professional Standards Unit, PIPS, are still investigating the attack on the innocent journalist. Today, a team of top police officers visited Joy News' offices reassuring they will get to the bottom of the matter. Director General of Public Affairs and Director of Operations, DCOP Simon Afiku, spoke to the news team. Uh, it's unfortunate that somebody should die or somebody should get injured out of any situation. Uh, that way we should all avoid. Um, uh, we have continued uh, to impress upon the public, uh, various stakeholders, uh, to support us uh, in doing our work. Uh, we cannot do without uh, stakeholders like you. Uh, you are very strategic uh, partners in the performance of our duties. We can meet at the common point, which we call peace, or a secured environment for all of us to continue carrying out our lawful activities. That assurance is there that at the end of whatever work, or findings that we will come out with, uh, the police administration will not renege. If anybody is found culpable of performing unprofessionally or criminally, no, uh, dealt with accordingly. Latif Idrisu, who is currently undergoing treatment, spoke about his current state of health. I still have severe pains in my head, and I've run about four different X-rays. Um, the last doctor I met asked that I run CT scan <clears throat> of my skull, uh, which I did, and the result came out on Friday. It has shown that I have fracture in my skull, and so I've been referred yet again to meet a neurosurgeon at the Kolebu. Chief Human Resources Officer of the multimedia group, Samo Nana Elegba, says the police must speed up investigations. We were taking aback, um, honestly, um, because we all heard the reports about um, what happened to Latif. Uh, we didn't think it was that serious. Um, yes, we made sure that he quickly went to uh, the hospital to run tests to see the doctor to make sure that he was fine. Um, a series of tests were run, and just last Friday, um, when the reports came out, all the final reports, it was realized that the extent of injury was worse, much worse than uh, was initially assumed, um, to the extent that uh, Latif has now been referred to see a specialist um, at Kolebu. I believe that he'll be doing that sometime today. Uh, um, and so, um, we, we are all sad at what has happened, and we are wishing Latif speedy recovery. Um, in the aftermath of the assault, a formal complaint was lodged um, with the cantonment uh, police. Uh, they promised um, investigations into the matter, 
as at now, we've not heard anything from them. Let's stay on this a while longer because colleagues in the industry, journalists, are calling for immediate action by the Ghana Journalists Association to end attacks on them in their line of duty following last month's assault on uh, Latif Idris. Uh, Mr. Idris was uh, left with a fractured skull, as you heard there, after police attacked him uh, whilst he was covering that protest that involved uh, NDC Deputy General Secretary Koko Anyiroho. Uh, the journalists say the situation is worrying. Assault on journalists is something that we've generally spoken up against uh, because um, um, there have been several instances where journalists are assaulted. We make noise about it and nothing happens. Um, I think that the GJA Media Foundation for West Africa and all the key um, institutions that fight for the welfare of journalists should take it a notch higher. Perhaps um, collaborate with the Ghana Police Service, um, assist them, investigate in a, a specific, specific reference to Latif's case. Um, it was a police officer who assaulted him. But um, I think that Gigi or the West African Media Foundation and all other key stakeholders when it comes to the, um, the welfare of journalists should come together and try and put together a, a committee of a sort that will assist the police in investigating um, what happened to Latif. I you see, we all have our jobs that we are supposed to do. Um, someone's job is to produce food. Someone's job is to drive a vehicle. Someone's job is to protect the country. Our job is to tell the story of ordinary people. Now, if in the course of doing this job, I am assaulted, that is offensive not only to my person, but to the Constitution of the Republic, which guarantees the freedom of my job. Our job is guaranteed in a whole article in the 1992 Constitution. Now, my expectation is that we should be doing this job unhindered. Why would someone attack us? Now, I think it is because over the period, policemen and soldiers and all these guys in the security industry or services, they take these things, they do these things, and they, they go scot-free. No one really holds them responsible because, after, after all, it's just an ordinary journalist with a you know a reporter who cares. I think we should act now or forever continue to receive slaps. Having been a victim of assault by state security and party-sponsored hoodlums on my own person in the course of my work as a journalist, I feel it when one journalist, even a single journalist, is touched by the police. And what happened to Latif at the police headquarters two weeks ago, you know, is unacceptable and must be condemned in all, you know, um, 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 you know, in all measures. It must be. Well, president of the GJA, Afil Money, has been assuring the journalists they will be protected so they can work freely. Mr. Money says he will be meeting the IGP soon to firm up plans on how to avoid a repeat of such attacks. Issued a statement to condemn what happened. This is just the first step. We, we, we have a meeting with the IGP and its top hierarchy. That's on Wednesday. We, 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 we've we learned that uh, an investigation has begun into Latif's issue. Our action or series of actions we are going to take are predicated on the principle that once you attack one single journalist, then you, you attack all of us. And once you attack all of us, then you attack our democracy. And once you attack our democracy, then you attack the very soul of this nation. All of us are bleeding profusely from the attack inflicted on Latif. Um, our meeting, after meeting the IGP, we shall unfold our next line of action. We, we, are, we are not lying low. We will not sit down unconcerned for, for, for this to happen. In the past, we are accused of just issue statements and going to sleep. This will not happen. We have other option of putting together a team of lawyers who rallies to our defense in such instances. We should also unfold that option. As if we have plan A up to plan Z, and depending on what the IGP will tell us, we shall activate the appropriate plan in response to what has happened to Latin. 
is still watching Joy News Prime. Still to come, alleged rapist of 24-year-old Italian girl at Damongo Hospital denies allegations leveled against him. We will hear the latest on that matter. In business, Third World Network Africa calls on government to ratify the ILO Health and Safety Convention to compel mining companies to take up responsibility for health and safety of contract staff at mining sites. That's coming up next with Emmanuel Abwaji. We have Stay tuned. Hello again. Good evening to you. Time now for business. Executive Director of the Third World Network Africa, Dr. Yao Graham, is renewing the call for government of Ghana to ratify the Health and Safety Convention by the International Labour Organization, ILO. He said Ghana's inability to ratify the convention is creating a room for mining companies to get away with responsible responsibility of health and safety issues of contracting staff. This follows the unfortunate incident that happened at the Newmont Ahafo Mines over the weekend. In an exclusive interview with Joy Business, Dr. Graham thinks the convention is long overdue since Ghana is a signatory to the ILO. The International Labour Organization's Convention on Health and Safety in Mining ensures that all mining companies take full responsibility of individuals having access to the mining site either on contract or permanent terms. According to Dr. Yao Graham, Ghana's inability to ratify the convention is creating a room for mining companies to get away with responsibility for the health and safety of its contracting staff at the mine sites. He was commenting on the recent incidents that claimed six lives of Consul Limited staff at the Newmont Ahafo Mines in the Bronga Ahafo region. In addition to the government, uh, to, to the issue about casualization, there's also the question about what is the strength of the, of the government's inspectorate for health and safety issues in mines. Thirdly, there's a global regime, the ILO Convention 176 on health and safety in mines, which the Ghana government has not ratified. If we ratified ILO Convention 176, it would lay the legal basis for us to beef up you know, the, the demands we can make of the mines and also the institutional regime that we set up to enforce health and safety uh, in mines. So you think we should ratify that deal? I've been, we've been campaigning and the, the, yeah, we should, we should. Dr. Graham spoke on the sidelines of a stakeholders meeting on the future of cooperation between European Union and Africa. He explained the need for the roundtable discussion. It's about the future of Africa, EU, Relation actually more broadly about is within the of the relationship between Europe and the African Caribbean Pacific countries because 2020 will mark the end of the Cotonou Agreement, which has been the framework for Africa EU relations, EU ACP relations. So the the experience, the experience of the of, of Africa EU relationship. For many people, has been symbolized by the acrimony around the negotiation of the economic partnership agreements. Because the word partnership, when we think about it, connotes equality, reciprocity, trust, giving, and taking. The three-day event is being organized by the Nordic Africa Institute, the University of Ghana, and the Institute of African Studies and the Third World Network Africa. Ebenezer Sabuti report for Joy Business. The British High Commission in collaboration with the Scotland Development International, SGI, is leading a 22-member delegation of investors aiming to explore business opportunities in the oil and gas sector. The aim is also to take advantage of the technical and human resource opportunities in Ghana's oil and gas value chain. That's more in the following business following report. With a deeper knowledge and broader experience in the oil and gas industry, the 22-member delegation is confident of hoping to make Ghana's oil and gas sector far more competitive on the world market. Cameron Douglas is the international executive for the Scotland Development International. I think it's strong. I think it's in a good place, particularly for West Africa. It's probably one of the sort of highlights, standout industries. Um, I think for us, it's around okay, how do you take that forward? Um, sort of increasing efficiencies, sort of making it more productive, and we have expertise and skill sets that we feel can help with that. Um, and sort of the interest from Ghana, we've had that they're very keen to hear from us, engage with us, and collaborate, and at the end of the day, do business. 
The coming on board of these Scottish investors was based on close engagement with the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce, which has been acting as an agent between the investors and Ghana. Derek Kobina is the head of operations for the Chamber. He spoke to Joy Business. In the UK Ghana Chamber, um, we have a great partnership with the Scottish Development International. So we really are our official partners helping us to support them when it comes to these trade missions. Yeah, both from Ghana to Aberdeen and from Aberdeen to Ghana as well. Yes. You have, I believe you have listened to most of these investors, um, their concerns, uh, their hopes for, you know, having to explore the fields here in Ghana. What are some of the concerns that they've raised with you? I think um, the concerns are when it comes to the local content and, and, and the regulations behind the local partnership. I think there's always confusion and that's what as a chamber and with the SDI we are trying to help for the investors or these people coming into Ghana to understand the actual the framework behind all that. Meanwhile, the Scottish investors wish some issues with the macroeconomic outlook will be addressed. Simon King is sales and business development manager of a global technology firm, Regnet. He laments to joy business the higher cost of business in Ghana's oil and gas sector. The thing about Ghana in the Gulf of Guinea is its ambition to be one of the most easiest businesses, sorry, countries to do business within. So coming from the UK, having worked in Nigeria in the past, when we look at Ghana, we see, okay, the market is not as large as you know, maybe Angola or, or Nigeria, but it has a, a very easy way of doing business. Okay, uh, I'm worked. Now, all these investors are currently here in Ghana to explore opportunities in the oil and gas sector. One of the key concerns that they've raised is the issue related to the local content law. They want clear clarity on this, especially as it's going to affect the operations and also determine whether or not an establishment here in Ghana is in the right place. Charles Ayato reporting from the British High Commission here in Accra. The general manager of the GN Bank, Issa Adam, believes the introduction of the Ghana reference rate could go a long way to reduce the cost of credit in the banking sector. The central bank introduced in its quest to help reduce interest rates by commercial banks the Ghana reference rate. Speaking to Joy Business, Issa Adam says the new model will not only liberalize the financial market but also heighten competition. The Ghana reference rate is a good thing. Uh, that is even going to make it more competitive. Now we all have the same base rate. Then you add whatever your premium is. Once we are operating in a free market economy, if you, if you put in very high risk premium, then you may not get customers to come to you to take loans. I know that banks, we depend on loans for our income. Uh, one of our basic incomes is from loans, interest on loans. So if you are not able to come up with something which is acceptable to customers, then you might, be, you might price yourself out of the market and that will create problems for you in meeting your bottom line. To bring down the cost of credit to some level, but not uh, what people are expecting. Currently, we come up with uh, is it 16.8 or so. And uh, so uh, premium, if a person will ask for temp premium, and take note that uh, it's not going to be uniform for all uh, sectors of the economy. Um, the risk involved in giving loans to the commercial, uh, call it uh, trading entities, is not the same as giving it to uh, manufacturing companies, and it's not the same as giving it to, uh, call it, uh, uh, companies that are engaged in construction. And that's all in business tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Imano Apuachi. We are fake. That's more news ahead. Good evening. You're welcome back. Now, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority is assuring Ghanaians who do not have a tax identification number or TIN that they can still register their vehicles and apply for licenses in spite of the insistence on applicants to show proof of their tax identification numbers. There were fears by motorists that they would be turned away by the authority if they did not have a TIN. But in an interview with Joy News, Joy News a Deputy Director of the DVLA, Kafui Semevo said, the Ghana Revu Revenue Authority has uh, set up shop at some selected offices of the DVLA to help facilitate the registration process. According to him, applications for licensing, uh, registration of vehicles and tax identification numbers will run
simultaneously as selected officers of the DVLA. We'll hear from the DVLA boss shortly, but first, Maxwell Abogba has been speaking to some applicants at the DVLA offices at 37. We are here at the 37 offices of the Driver Vehicle and Licensing Authority. Um, the usual hassle and bustle has not started yet. We are told that work usually starts here at 8.30 a.m. Um, so in some uh, minutes, uh, you'd see a lot of vehicles coming in here. Uh, you have uh, people also walking in here to register their vehicles or get their driver's you know, licenses. Uh, we've been interacting with um, some of the workers here and we've been told um, that currently the management of the DVLA um, is locked up in a meeting on the second floor in one of the offices here. But I have two people uh, who are here to register their vehicles. We want to have them join us. In fact, I'm in favor of it. Okay. I'm in favor of it. I mean, just for the... Um, the, 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 the <clears throat> essence of it i mean the whole exercise that in an effort to capture more mm. people into the system mm. to pay their tax because it's a civil responsibility mm. yeah it's a civic responsibility to pay your tax yeah. and i cannot understand why you have very few people mm. who are capturing the system and who are burdened mm. with this uh, uh, you, responsibility you, 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 no please mm. i don't have currently you don't have currently yeah. because if you go to most advanced countries let's say america europe they depend on taxes mm. to develop their nation Okay. So why is it that we travel outside to those countries and we abide by their laws and regulations in those countries? Mm -hmm. And most of our big men in this country travel to UK, America, they pay their taxes over there. So why can't you play the same thing in your, your own country, Ghana? Do mm -hmm. you get me? So I don't see, I don't, I don't see this thing as a burden to... No, no, no. no. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will help improve our tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, listen to Deputy Director of the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, Kafui Semevo, explaining how an online system will soon be deployed to make the process faster. From today, the 9th of June, uh, April 2018, we are requiring that every person who comes in to apply for driver's license for the first time and persons registering vehicles will have to provide a thing before we, are, uh, we provide them the service. But what we've done is that the GRA had actually uh, stationed some staff here at the DVLA premises, and we are going to work with the staff who register persons who do not have the thing before applying for the services to obtain the thing. We've also agreed that once you register for the thing, we'll continue to provide you with the service the DVLA provides, and then by the end of the service process, you would have obtained your thing, and then we also fill in the gaps that we need to fill or we take the number of the thing and then add it to our processes mm -hmm. so that is what we've agreed to do it is just to make it convenient for our customers not to be unduly delayed and also ensure that the law is successfully implemented but well, going forward uh, this team is temporary on our premises they are gra is going to work to deploy an online system for registration and then for verification of uh, the thing numbers as months we have been trying to streamline our business processes and that is why we had to meet with the gra agree on modalities that will not take back uh, the processes to where it were or the delays should be reduced okay now that is why we are also interested in the gra deploying the online system in good time for us to still maintain our delivery times and for it to be convenient for our customers to obtain the services they apply for. You're still watching Join News Prime. I'm Arba Kumsen. Stay tuned because uh, we still have entertainment ahead. But right now, Northern Region Police Public Relations Officer ASP Mohamed Tango has disclosed that the alleged rapist of the 24-year-old Italian girl has denied allegations leveled against him. Ernest Green is being held for allegedly raping the patient who went to the Damango Hospital uh, for malaria treatment last Friday. Speaking to Joy News is Gifty and our peer on investigations so far, ASP Mohamed Tanku said the suspect has denied the accusation, but the police is awaiting the medical report to ascertain the truth. Uh, we've not been able to establish any concrete fact as of now. When you understand or and agree with me that for fact, they come only after investigations been uh, thoroughly conducted. We are still conducting investigations. This morning, the suspect, that is N.S. Green, was taken to 
the Tamale District of One, where he has been remanded into police custody to allow for further investigations to be conducted. As I speak to you, uh, the officers from the regional uh, CID have taken the suspect and the complainant to uh, Damango to uh, try to establish one or two uh, things. And uh, that, will, uh, that, that is geared towards uh, ascertaining exactly what happened that particular dawn that the lady complained about. So that is uh, where we are now. Right. L let me find out from you if the, 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 the gentleman in question, Mr. Green, whether or not he admits to, the, to, to uh, rape in his statement. No, he has not admitted. He has denied that uh, uh, he has denied anything like that uh, mm. happened. Okay. Uh, so it is now up to us uh, to try to carry on investigations as we are doing, to try to establish uh, the case against mm. him or who is innocent. Now, Kweku Asante Krobia is president of the Ghana Registered Nurses Association and board member of the governing council of the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Ghana. He joins us on the line now. Many thanks for your time. Good evening to you. Uh, good evening. Now, this is a very peculiar case. It's a case of he said, she said. The police said that the nurse has uh, denied the accusation against him, leveled against him. Uh, from where you stand, what information have you received on this matter? All right. Uh, normally, when uh, such an incident occurs, we also conduct our own investigations. And if it is not, it didn't happen at the spot where headquarters officials are close to the incident. We request our regional officer or district officers to get in. Fortunately, the vice president of the association lives in the family. So we are, I have been in contact with him to get us some underlying facts and uh, reliable information as to whether a gentleman uh, committed the offence that is alleged to have committed. And uh, we have also managed to go through an uh, uh, investigation and uh, also personal contact. The gentleman has denied uh, that such a thing occurred. And uh, so uh, before we could establish any facts, we probably um, we could bring him before an uh, the GT committee or the senior committee, um, we are still conducting uh, our investigations. Then we are in touch with our people in the northern region. Mm. But is this something that happens often? Have you come across such a case? Oh, not that I can recall. No. You know, um, I, I do not want to get some extent where people would say I'm holding brief for the gentleman, but uh, uh, this is not uh, a thing that uh, male nurses uh, do. Uh, it is uh, because of our discipline and uh, code of conduct and etiquette, this is unthinkable. And uh, uh, we have never recorded any such incident or witnessed such an incident occurring among male nurses. Very well, we'll have to leave it here. You're welcome back. It's been about a decade since their widely publicized divorce. Reverend Dr. Francisca Duncan Williams, ex-wife of Archbishop Nicholas uh, Duncan Williams, has been talking women empowerment in which she urges feminist groups like Pepper Them and Sugar Them movements to work together in the interest of women in the country. She also talks about moving on after her divorce and how her marriage to the Archbishop has shaped her life and ministry over the years. She's been speaking in an exclusive interview with my colleague Gifty Andoapia. Let's first hear her on how women can be empowered in a rather patriarchal environment. We complement each other. You know, God said it's not for the man to be alone. So definitely we and the woman compliments the man. Mm. And so we, we, I believe that is a call authority. It's something that we do together. It, it, to pepper them or to sugar them, you know, either way may not be the best. Okay. But let's work together. For example, if I want to lift something up, 
you know, as a woman, yeah, my strength goes to a certain limit. Okay. But if there's a man there, you know, that man can lift it higher than I can. I can lift something up, yes. But can I, I there, there are certain things I cannot lift up as mm. a woman. And there are certain things that men can do that women and, and, can do Exactly. Well. Can a man go to the labor ward? I have seen men faint in the labor ward. I've, I've heard of men run out of the labor ward. But here is the woman who goes there, faces it, comes out, and carries the baby. Mm. You understand? So I think what we should realize is not really after the man or after the woman or what the man can do or what the woman can do. But we must realize that we all have a, a purpose. Okay. You think that we are really taking this women empowerment a bit too far? No, I think, I think we're, we're doing fine. I believe that there's even more room for improvement. Okay. Um, the reason being that I'm beginning to see women rising up to where they belong. Listen to her as she speaks on her ex-husband's role in her life. Everybody goes through challenges in life. I always say one thing that if there's no testing, there is no reward. Okay. You cannot go from class one to class. Everybody goes through a test. God has a purpose for my life. Who I am today is because I was married to Archbishop Duncan Williams. I wasn't a, I wasn't a preacher, but this man put some fire in me. And today, whoever I am, by the grace of God, there is no one person I can point but him to say that he helped me walk this road. I wasn't a, a, a woman of God when I was married to him. I believe that I have also been a blessing to him as much as he has also been a blessing to me. Right. So yes, again, I'm coming back to my first point. It's a, it's a complimentary thing. Okay. To, together we fought, together we prayed, together we built. Action, was there in the foundation you should have seen us in our chalet water and in the mud and the prayer and the thing so i'm really open to what plan god has, god has for my you. life okay. he's moved on with his life and i'm just again telling you that i am doing what god has called me to do life moves on yeah. and i think that is where we we need to take it from still i have coco board ceo dr stephen opudi in the headlines rather former coco board ceo uh, Dr. Stephen Opuni demands documents to be used by the Attorney General in his trial of causing financial loss to the state, among other charges. Meanwhile, the Attorney General has been responding to the demand, saying they will provide the documents. What Polytechnic Rector fights off accusations by lecturers there, he breached procurement procedures to buy a Mercedes-Benz car worth half a million Ghana cities. Alleged rapist of 24-year-old Italian girl at Damongo Hospital denies allegations leveled against him. We heard that from uh, the Ghana Registered Nurses Association. In business, Third World Network Africa calls on government to ratify the ILO Health and Safety Convention to compel mining companies to take up responsibility for health and safety of contract staff at mining.